It's good to see the Monster Hunter franchise doing so well. Back before World, I had only ever had extensive experience with Freedom Unite for the PSP. I've seen Tri-G do well, 4, Ultimate, Generations, all the way up to Asshole Fondle Ultimate Master Edition for the Motorola Razor. Yet a vet from the series would understand the games are great, and doing well shouldn't be a surprise. They seem relatively simple, yet extensive for majoritively mobile platforms. But what makes the Monster Hunter series so great? And how did World skyrocket to the top of Capcom sales for a series so unrecognized in the West? By unrecognized, I mean the original Monster Hunters did not sell well in the West, yet obtained a loyal following so dense it warranted sequel after sequel, but mostly to portable consoles after the initial PlayStation 2 release. The reason for mostly portable consoles is because in Japan, LAN is an invaluable part of video games. I asked my friend Gure who lives in Japan and his statement was people here are like a pair of chopsticks. I snapped them in two. He didn't actually say that, but people in Japan are closer space-wise than here in the West. So having the game's main appeal being to play with other people was a great idea. Where's the flute, Swanee? Shut up, I'm making meat. <laughs> yeah, I hope you fucking eat that! <laughs> <laughs> Music. <laughs> Yet in America, that's not as great as a selling point as you think. So eventually, having dedicated multiplayer servers available, that's the real play. But I'm getting too far into stuff that doesn't matter. What is Monster Hunter? Well, you hunt monsters. It's in the title. Okay, I'm very glad we got that out of the way. Monster Hunter, in my humble opinion, is not anything too special. It's really simple with zero story to back up its gameplay loop. And I'm dead serious here when I say I have never played a Monster Hunter that had a story worth caring about. And you know, that's for two reasons only. They aren't worth investing to, and eventually you play past the story. The story ends in most of them, while the gameplay takes over after. In Freedom Unite, the Poke Village needs someone to make the land safer so they can receive more trade income. Oh god, oh god! It's still perfect! <laughs> this takes about four hours. Monster Hunter's story is nothing special. However, the lore of the game and the backstories of the monsters are incredibly special. You don't need to tell me why I'm here. I know why I'm here, and that's to hunt monsters. But what I'd like to know is why the monsters are here, as their endemic and ecological impact on the world is fascinating and worth learning about, and perhaps it'll help you prepare to fight most of them. So what exactly is the basic core gameplay loop of Monster Hunter? Well, you're a hunter. Human, normal, there isn't much special about you. Ignoring the lore, okay? This is meant to be a self-insert for the player. You are currently at a village with a substantial monster problem, and you're the only one brave enough to do anything about it. And with the help of a hearty meal and the local blacksmith, you defeat monsters twice to six times your size to help the village. I'll do this flute, but you gotta keep running. Going to you, he's going to you. Yep, yes he is. Put the fucking flute away! Oh, I blocked it! Of course, you'll be compensated in two ways. Financially, and with monster parts. Seriously. Carves, guts, tails, wings, webbings, eyeballs, and condensed gems located in their bodies. You name it. Their parts are integral to your survival. You simply just gut them like a serial killer. You cut them open from head to toe to figure out what to wear. And I meant that. Like a runway at a fashion show, the local blacksmith can refine the parts you've given him into a suit of armor, or a weapon made from the monster itself. This goes for every single monster in the game. Oh shit, another one bites the dust. <laughs> Shut the fuck up! Number one. It's a beautiful, simple, and in-depth gameplay loop that has latched onto the flagship system they've curated. If you see a cool monster, hunt it. And check its gear. You'll probably like what you see. They all have unique perks that help the way you play, and go with certain weapons that probably benefit the style you have. It's always an interesting system to see go so far without too many changes. With every installment, a new set of monsters comes out, which means a new set of weapons and armor to look at. His name is Epstein. Bring down the hammer! <laughs> <laughs> oh I just fucking Holy... sleep, god damn it! <laughs> Holy shit, Jay. It's a sense of pride and accomplishment that is not only shown on a list of things you've killed, it's your armor that shows your dedication as well. This accomplishment is met with some hard walls too. The series is not easy. It never was. Difficulty is the core, quote unquote, issue with getting into these games. They were hard as fuck! Monster Hunter took difficulty levels, chewed them up, and spat them out. 
folded them neatly, and served them to you with some fucking banging food themes. What? A new player would usually be intimidated by these spikes in difficulty, but in turn, getting past them was a form of pride that's only explainable by a CAT scan of the boner a carved monster would give me. Keep in mind, I haven't spoken much about the monsters yet, but I'm getting there. A prime example of the difficulty in the game would be a phrase dubbed the Potion Flex. In order to heal in the original games, you'd have to select your healing potions, sit still, eat it, and wait for your health to come back. Then, do the Potion Flex. You cannot move while doing this action. You can be hit, knocked over, or even killed while doing this move. And if you are, that means you have to go back and heal again, leading to more openings and more windows to take more damage. Another example is the Sharpness Gauge. Realistically, when you use a weapon a bunch, it gets dull, right? Well, if your weapon gets too dull, it does next to no damage. In fact, your weapon can bounce off of a monster's armor, making you seemingly worthless. To remedy this, you bring a whetstone. They cost next to nothing, but are integral. Take up pouch space, and even have a pouch limit, so you can run out of them on a hunt. I know he's slow. It oh my Jesus Christ! Surprise, cockbag! Your preparation goes much further than this. Your preparation is your survival in a hunt. You aren't just fighting a monster, you are hunting it. Meaning you need to track it, keep in good shape when you find it, and make sure not to lose it. And pray to God you have paintballs. Because if you don't, you could realistically be searching the whole map for this thing. Oh shit, he's rolling in. Don't worry, it, there's no way we can lose. I'll go a little deeper into this difficulty through a weapon example, starting with the first weapon that I tried, and it was a weapon to attract a majority of players. The Greatsword. What? The Greatsword in the original Monster Hunters, it's slow, it's clunky, and has terrible recovery. It was generally a huge pain in the ass, but there was a catch. Risk versus reward was this weapon's mantra. It hit monsters the hardest. This thing looked heavy, this thing played heavy, and buddy, let me tell you, you wanted to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a person able to wield this big fucking thing, you better have your bags packed because you're getting smacked into next week. It also had this great benefit to feeling good as well. It had all the feedback needed to do well, and it had the numbers to match it. It was, gameplay-wise, a great choice, but player-wise, a uh, waste of effort sometimes. It left you open, it held you in one place, it was utter crap and totally worth it. Whetstones keep you still, potions keep you still. Sometimes attacking keeps you still, but what's the purpose of it all? And it's gonna sound tedious, but bear with me on this. So far, I've only mentioned things that don't seem great. Your sharpness, your prep, your main weapon is clunky and unappealing. So what's keeping me pressing forward? What is such a big damn deal that I have to deal with these unattractive game mechanics? The monsters. We killed him? Nope. No, we did! We killed him with four seconds to yeah. spare! We oh, killed no. him with four seconds what? to spare! Holy shit! The monsters in Monster Hunter are a big deal. It's in the name of the game. These things were huge and sometimes pretty scary. Oh, nice. Let's go. Oof! Oof! No! Jeno! 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 Sorry! There you go. There's a little bit of help. Make it last. Oh my god! They got meaner and meaner as they got closer and closer to death. They would shout, causing you to plug your ears. They could bleed, poison, bite, tail whip, and body slam you. They had this added benefit of being really damn cool sometimes. And starting with Monster Hunter Freedom Unite for the PSP in 2008, my first introduction to Monster Hunter, you're in a small little cozy village with a comfy tune called the Poke Village. To the right of the village is the farm, a place you can fish, gather bugs, mine, and plant some herbs for future use. Once you've done all that, head on home for a tasty meal made by some palicos for you. I almost forgot to mention the palicos. The palicos are little sidekicks that can help you fight the monsters. They're simple, little, cute cat folk. Go into more detail some other time. All right, so you have a meal. Your farm is prepped. You head over to the elder and you grab a quest. And let's say you don't want to start from the very beginning. Let's give you something that will actually give you a challenge. Your great sword's ready and you want to use it without hopefully carting too many times. So let's start with a fair one. Yan Kutku. Yan Kutku is a goofy little chicken wyvern that pecks his beak and has big ol' ears and likes to throw fireballs at you, even though he's a low rank creature. I'll bring up rank some other time. Now as I mentioned, monsters are generally really cool. 
This one, though, though visually not super impressive, has a detail about him that a good hunter will spot. Take a look. Take a really good look. What's a unique thing about this monster that you see? It's not the wings, and it's not the claws. It's not even the beak. Take a look at these glorious ears. I bet he's got pretty great hearing, don't you think? Something with ears this big must have good use for him. Well, I'm glad you noticed, because they aren't just for show. The game at the beginning gives you these little consumables called sonic bombs. Sonic bombs are described as a controlled loud noise bomb. Hmm. A bomb that makes a loud noise on a quest with a creature that has big ears. Let's try putting these together. And boom, look at that. A creature that has large ears is sensitive to sound. Almost every creature in the series has a unique feature that can correlate to this. Some are dumbed down, and some are incredibly cool. Interaction with the monsters has created a sense of interest from the player to the monster. You eventually found relationships with them, and you liked them. You learned their names, their fighting styles, their patterns, and you eventually learned to master a hunt. Yeah, I know, it's a punk duck reference. And you should go watch his video too, it's rather good. The reason the gameplay style is committed to keep you in one place is to punish you for not learning things about the creature. Their attack patterns, their attack styles, their elements, what they're weak to, what they're not weak to. You're not going to use a whetstone when it's about to prep an attack, right? So you should probably learn when it has an opening. And through perseverance, you finally earn your first bagged creature. Capped or killed doesn't matter. Well, now you've got some spare parts, easily outfitted into a new suit of armor for you, and a new weapon to make things even better. Oh, seems you want an upgrade. Well, that's going to cost you some more parts, so you better get hunting. Making the monsters huge and a part of the upgrade system was a genius idea. You weren't going on a quest to get some money alone to purchase better gear. No, that, that'd be too simple. You were going on this quest for progression and value. Money was a side pot, while the main pot was parts. But the game had to go and make even that difficult. You see, sometimes a suit of armor needs a bit more than just a couple of parts. Sometimes it needs a lot of parts, and sometimes that requires a lot of hunts. Or sometimes you needed one specific part with a pathetic drop rate. Or sometimes you need a part that can only be acquired by breaking a piece off a monster and increasing the drop rate of that item. They not only made the hunting aspect difficult, the combat difficult, and the survival difficult, they went further and made your success as difficult as possible as well. God damn it! You can even fail to get a good meal in the earlier games, which can lead to less health and stamina on a hunt you prepped for. Gathering took a long time for no discernible reason, and carving takes a long time for no discernible reason. Farming, prep, eating, talking, going through menus. None of this is quick and simple. That's because patience and difficulty was a staple of this series. Keeping every aspect of this game hard made its successes even sweeter. Patience. Patience. Actually, speaking of patience, go ahead and ask yourself. Did you personally think the intro to this specific video was a tad too long? Just hear me out. Did you at any point skip or think to yourself, Man, this is kind of cool. Or maybe you didn't think that. But it sure is taking a bit. If you didn't, that's fine. If you did, that's also fine. But if you didn't have an issue with the length, you're probably from the first generation of hunters. And if you did, you're probably a fifth or later generation. Patience is a key component of the earlier games. It filtered and annoyed many people, myself included. But as I played more and more, I never really cared about how much time a gathering quest or a normal quest took. Time was not an issue. Now, I'm not going to defend searching a fucking beehive six times only to get four honey. That's just annoying and absurd. But it's the fact I will still continue to do it every single quest because it doesn't bother me anymore. I can tell for a fact that the devs of the original Monster Hunters use tediousness to artificially pad the time you'll spend playing the game. I have easily spent over 60 hours alone just being in menus or just gathering or farming. But at the end of it, they did something. Now, this exact statement is why this video is taking so long to make. The sentence I'm going to tell you right now. I don't know why I love the original Monster Hunters, but I really, really do. Somehow, some way, on accident or sheer genius, 
I found myself desiring to play Freedom Unite every single day for hours on end. I have put up with unfair hitboxes, I have pushed through the boring menu hunting, and I have even gone through and got an entire set of Silver Rathalos and Golden Raytheon armor. Two armor sets that have five pieces each to them, ten total, that require a fucking Rathalos and a fucking Raytheon ruby per piece of armor. By the way, gems in high rank have a 4% chance of dropping. But I did. I fought them. I killed them, and I carved them, and I did it over and over and over again because I don't know why I love the original Monster Hunters but I really, really do. Somehow through Capcom's desire to pad the game and make things tedious, they accidentally curated a list of charming game mechanics that only get you to learn things. Repetition is the easiest way to get someone to learn something. How do you study for school? You go over stuff you've heard in the classroom. How do you learn a monster's attack pattern? You fight it multiple times. How do you increase your chances of finding rare materials? You keep trying and trying and trying until you get one. Repetition, patience, memory, all of these subconsciously make you a better hunter. When Kishala Dora jumps back, he usually does a small shout. When Yon Kutku gets pissed, he always gets fire around his beak. When Kongalala gets mad, he starts farting more frequently. I didn't look any of these up. These are just things I just know. The early generations of Monster Hunter gave players challenge after challenge and difficulty spike one after another for the sole purpose of enforcing repetition and applying memory. This is why almost nothing is taught to you about the game, as they encourage you to explore and experiment and apply basic knowledge. I would argue a hunter from this series that managed to enjoy it this far would be a lifelong fan for years to come. If, that is, they can handle the walls. Walls are a coined term for innate difficulty spikes that challenge you so sharply that if you can overcome them, you can physically see your forward progress. Everyone's walls are different. Mine were very three specific monsters. Monsters so terrifying and malicious, and my malice towards them is so dense that I paid an NSFW artist to draw massive honkers on them so I could laugh at them while I talk about them. The clickbait will be worth it every time. I just wanna fuck you, can't you tell that by now? Oh my fucking god, shut up. My walls were the terrible trio. Three monsters I have fought countless times, and I haven't even gotten all their moves down yet. Three monsters were carding against them is never off the table, regardless of my rank. My very first wall was Tigrix. Tigrix is mean, unforgiving, and brutal. He's an urgent quest, so there's no ignoring this one. Tigrix was actually the reason the previous hunter of the village went into retirement. He got injured fighting him. You actually meet Tigrix rather fast in an earlier quest. He's a constant reminder that there are things way outside your skill set that you will eventually be able to defeat. Once you've geared up and become mentally prepped to fight anything, it's time to take on Tigrix. Tigrix's presence immediately becomes known. The lack of endemic life on the way to the top of the mountains, the amount of time it takes to reach him, I personally was incredibly nervous. And for the first time in Monster Hunter history, I was scared. I'm genuinely nervous. I, I, I actually have the, I have butterflies in my stomach right now. So I'm definitely worried about this. Cause Tigrix is a bitch. There he is. All my mental prep, all my items, all of my knowledge in this game, it felt not enough. I felt like I was not ready. And yet there was nothing more for me to do. I was at my first wall and Tigrix was there to greet me with keys in hand. I had to use all of my knowledge and my patience in order to take down Tigrix. I learned he takes a breather when he jumps back. I learned that his spin move is misleading and much larger than it looks. I learned if I'm too far away, Tigrix will throw rocks at me. I read this monster like a book, and I read it a college grade level. No nuts, no butts, no coconuts. I had officially become the hunter the town needed. I was ready, and there was nothing that was going to stop me from defeating this beast. And then, I failed. I failed. I failed and I failed. There's a reason that these are called walls. I had hit my head against this thing at least 9 or 12 times. I lost count to be honest, but even on my 11th try, 
Everything I thought I knew just wasn't enough. My mind was on edge and my patience had wore thin. I was at the end of my rope. I thought for sure I just wasn't good enough to beat him. Then I had a thought. What if... What if I played a bit safer? Well, sure, it's slower and sure, it's not my style. But what if I gave myself a bit of space? This is a game from 2008, after all, so the hitboxes aren't very forgiving. And you know what? Why stop there? What more can I add to my preparation before I even start fighting this guy? I noticed that during all of these fights, I drink all of my potions in a matter of minutes. What if I brought more ingredients to make more potions as backup? Maybe some extra traps? Maybe some materials? Some bombs? Wait a minute. In Tigrix's ecology video and his introduction, he's always hunting popos the game's form of cattle. Popos have raw meat the hunter can use. I can poison and drug raw meat from Popos. Tigrix might try to eat that. And with these new ideas, I felt refreshed and good to go. Time felt slow and sluggish. I wasn't gonna make any more mistakes. And with time, finally took down my first big wall. Through my perseverance, preparation, skill, and pain, I overcame the first challenge presented to me that caused me to push myself to my absolute limits. It felt good. It felt rewarding and exciting. I could feel myself going further and further than this. This victory dictated my future and how I would handle any and all future quests. My second wall was a sand giant to be kinged above the rest, Diablos. Diablos is... there's there's words for this creature, and I, I can't say in public, otherwise I'm gonna lose my career. Diablos is large, he's loud, his hitboxes involve making his entire body an attack, he loves to run and dig underground. There's a lot of ways to counter him, sound bombs, flash bombs, they make him much easier to fight. But when you don't have them, or you run out, he becomes much harder than you'd think. Hardly any of his body is a weak spot, and his drops are abysmal, which means you gotta fight him a bunch. But through trials and tribulations, and through blood, sweat, and tears, I was finally able to defeat my second wall. Diablos fell to my blade, and I took my carves. And then I fought his wife. How can there be out of chicken? It's Colonel's Fried Chicken! Well, black women don't want to be happy. They squeeze out about seven or eight of them little nappy-headed chilling by the time they His wife is stronger, louder, side, blacker, and tougher than her husband. She's the one asking for no pickles in the relationship. Pain and suffering await these two, but as her husband before, she will fall just the same. Her defeat is another stepping stone in your progression towards stronger beasts. And along with her defeat, you will be prepared for anything in your path, until you hit your next wall. So real fast, this is off script. Right now, this marks about 60 percent, maybe 63 percent of the video done. But uh, just real fast, I'm gonna do a super fast sponsor. I mean, super fast. Okay, done. I just did it. I just did the sponsor. If you really cared that much about it, you can pause and save yourself some money on some gamer subs. But that's it. Like that's the whole sponsor. I'm done. I'm going back to the video now. My third and final wall that I will officially call my finale was the flagship creature to Freedom Unite, one that would snowball into some of the strongest and sharpest weapon types in the series, a pitch black wyvern with red eyes to be many people's worst nightmares, a menacing and threatening monster that would be my final wall that would test my skills in every way imaginable, a beast known as Nargakuga. Nargakuga is an interesting beast to me in Freedom Unite due to the fact that this game was his first appearance and would certainly not be his last. Oh! 
Nagakuga is known for being fast, agile, and dangerous when angered. He jumps around a lot and has multiple parts of his body as a weapon. His beak, his ranged scales that he throws, his massive and dangerous tail, his razor sharp wings, everything about him is sharp, so getting a weapon from him would yield something of the same theme, right? Nagakuga's first showcase into this series is a mean one. There's nothing about his fight that is simple. Even trying to cut off his tail is a challenge. You have to break it first, then wait for him to be angry, and then you can cut it. The game forces you to attack the strongest part of his body when he's at his most dangerous. It'll be worth it though, because it'll hinder him greatly. 60% of Nagakuga's attacks come from his tail. It's misleadingly large, and can stretch and slam to hit as hard as possible. He's a monster to be scared of for sure, but just like every other foe you've faced, he will fall all the same. You've learned from your previous tasks. Your experiences have culminated greatly to meet you at this roadblock. Nagakuga will be tough and challenging, but will be rewarding all the same. And after a handful of mistakes and a few failed quests, my final wall had fallen. I had defeated every beast that I had met to come this far. Sure, I'm not done, and there are many more monsters out there, some more dangerous than Nagakuga will ever be, but with my experiences logged and my bag prepped, I could see my future as bright as the sun in the sky. I wasn't scared of anything else in this game. I was done with that, and I knew that every new creature would be challenging, but I also knew I'd look good wearing them. Monster Hunter Freedom Unite was a wonderful experience. I envy those who were able to play it on launch. The awful hitboxes, the tediousness of gathering, the unfair endemic wildlife ganging up on you. Got you, you motherfucker! <laughs> I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I loved every minute of this awful game. The charm of the village, the comfiness of the farm, the cuteness of the palicos, the satisfaction of defeating a monster. It made me want to live in this world. It greeted me with open arms, and I felt a sense of warmness that only a town of this caliber could fill. I can't wait to try the new games. I want to see what they have to offer, and I'm sure they're just as good. So just to let people know, I know that there are a lot of games in the main series, like a bunch. But if you were like me as a kid, and you only played Freedom Unite, then World, then Rise. Well, the reason for that is I was an incredibly unfortunate kid growing up. I didn't own too many game consoles, hardly any. I grew up without TVs, bullied a lot by kids in my low-income schools. Parents had to sell a lot of my game consoles just to make rent. And too many fights. Now, you see, this is the part where you think I bring up politics or race, but I'm not gonna do that because that's boring. And my childhood was shit, but it's my childhood, not yours. There are a lot of black. So I went immediately from barely touching Freedom Unite all the way to World. And World is good, but to be honest, my save files on World are finicky and I can't confirm if I have my old save anymore. So to make things clear, I'm just gonna skip World and Iceborne right now. I never even really played Iceborne when my save file was still a thing because I played before Iceborne was a thing. So my knowledge on it is limited and I'm not a games journalist, so I'm not gonna talk about things I don't really have extensive knowledge John. So here's Monster Hunter Rise. Monster Hunter Rise, the latest installment in the series. It adds everything from World with a little bit more flair. And like I said before, I'm not gonna be talking about World, so I'll talk about everything World did different, along with Rise, due to the fact that Rise is effectively just World with a little bit more stuff. Really, honestly, if you want to try World or try Rise, 
try Rise first because it's a little easier, and then try World. But to keep things in the theme of Rise, everything is fast. Speed is everything. In Monster Hunter World, they did away with the classic style of the series and added a new way to play by speeding everything up. Gathering is fast, movement is fast, crafting is faster, removing a lot of the things you needed to craft. A potion is no longer an herb plus a blue mushroom, it's just an herb now. This is the new way to play Monster Hunter. What? What the? In Rise, they gave combat a facelift and gave exploring the map a buff as well by not only adding the Palicos, but adding the Palamutes, a mountable dog. In World and in Rise, there's a lot more weapons than when you played Freedom Unite. There's a lot, a lot, lot, all with unique styles as opposed to the 10 that were present in Freedom Unite. And Rise added on to that even more by increasing the amount of moves you have and by adding switch skills moves that replace a previous move with something else. The base combo in Rise for the Greatsword is having three charge attacks now instead of Freedom's just one. One of the Greatsword's switch skills is replacing a heavy damaging attack with an attack that comes with hyper armor instead of doing more damage. Along with switch skills, they've added this beautiful thing called the Wirebug. The Wirebug is Rise's bread and butter. The Wirebug is a movement-based aerial grappling hook. You can use it to climb walls, avoid monsters, and even benefit your switch skills. The Wirebug is used for mounting, traversing the map, and it's a little cute. And, uh, um, uh. Outside of just the combat, there's Kimura Village that is covered in this thick Japanese theme. The idea of blooming cherry blossoms, kimonos, ninjas, kunai is the works. Kimura is also home to some fine-ass anime babes called Hanoa and Minoto. <laughs> Something, something about eggs, something about laying eggs, I, I forget. Kimura is a wonderful place that has this really nice feeling to it, and I really like walking around the village. Um, where, where, um, uh. There's also a training area to make sure you know how to use your weapon. Along with weapons getting a huge upgrade, the monsters did as well. There's beautiful as ever along with the, hmm. Well, they're a lot prettier. The maps are large and the segmented parts of them got removed. Now it's all one big map that can be used to explore at once. No more paint balls. No more paint balls. Hmm. Yeah, I'd say things are a lot simpler this time around. Yeah. Yeah, simpler. Something... Something's missing. So something is, um... Now, let me preface this by saying one thing. Monster Hunter World and Monster Hunter Rise are really fun games and are wonderful additions to the series that any new player will deeply enjoy. There's an explicit reason as to why World and Rise sold so many copies. In fact, I'm almost certain World is Capcom's number one most sold game of all time. But there is a large difference in what makes these types of games the way they are. There's classic and then there's modern. Classic has the monotony, the tediousness, the potion flex, the paintballs, the classic way to play the game whereas Modern focuses more on fighting the monster rather than much anything else. Hell, even Rise's canteen kinda sucks now. You get these things called Dongo. They're cute, there's three of them, and each Dongo has an effect with a chance of working. You can buff that up, but that's not the point. They give you 50 stamina and 50 max health. That's pretty nice. Well, here's the thing. Um, your max HP and max stamina go way more than the base amount plus 50. They added these things called Spira Birds, mockingbird type creatures that have special pollen inside that can increase your max attack, defense, stamina, and max HP. The reason for this is to incentivize learning the map and to grab a handful of birds to get max stats. Now, you don't need to collect the birds. They're optional. No monster in the game is too hard without max stats. But that's not the point of the stats, you know? It's bad game design for the player to look at a buff and say, nah, I'd rather finish the quest. It's not even that getting them is hard, it's just they're tedious and you'd rather just not do it in the first place. Why would you ever look at a health buff or an attack buff and say it's not worth it? It doesn't even cost you anything to go get it other than going and getting it. Well, because eventually you're sick of fucking gathering these things. You don't need like a tiny amount either. It'd be a different story if it was just a handful of birds or a, a, like a good few of them. No, you need 13 each of these things, depending on the pedalus you have, which is an equipable thing that affects your stat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When in the previous games, the canteen did that before you left. So hear me out, let's do a compromise real fast. Let's do two things. Let my three Dongo either give me all my health and stamina and max stats, or let me choose three valuable buffs 
then gather the spirit birds if I want my health and other stuff back. Let me choose between max stats or valuable buffs. I think that's a great alternative, but it's not even just the canteen that got gutted a bit. The tracking was also shafted pretty hard. I never don't know where this monster is. I never spend any time looking for it. I never hunt the monster in Riser World. I never lose the fucking thing. I always have an idea where it is. I can't actually physically lose the monster at all. I also don't really ever need any prep for anything anymore outside of bringing basic supplies. In Freedom Unite, I would spend five minutes or more just keeping my item pouch full of things I could use, or in case of emergency use, to combine stuff. In Rise, nothing more is needed than 10 mega potions and 10 normal potions. Maybe antidotes and these new things called null berries that fix 80% of the ailments in the game. Otherwise, it's meaningless. Your fucking whetstone is infinite, so I don't need to buy those anymore. No more paintballs, nothing. My hunting prep and my mainline hunting materials are completely gone, and half of them are worthless. The interactivity of the world and the relationship between preparation and execution has been dumbed down severely. This was the same way in world as well. In Freedom Unite, if I don't bring cold drinks to the desert, my health will go down and would eventually kill me. If I didn't bring my own food, I wouldn't have enough max stamina to block or dodge attacks. I needed to prepare myself in order to succeed. In Rise, as long as my weapon hits hard and I'm not stupid and I didn't forget my drink. Oh, wait a minute. I can forget my drinks and I can forget to eat because of the ten and Rise lets you eat and restock your items. There's, there's no failure anymore. There's no way to lose. There's no way to be defeated by your own hubris. God forbid you go camping without a tent and you have to go home, huh? God forbid you go to a baseball game without a baseball bat. You go to the gun range without any ammo? Without preparation, you failed. That's what the old Monster Hunter games taught you. And Rise simply just lacks all of that. In Rise and in World, they did some game-changing stuff. And I I really hate to say it, but I, I kind of miss the Potion Flex. The Potion Flex is gone, and you can now walk and drink a potion at the same time. The trade-off for extra movement was now using potions is slower, and if interrupted, you will use the potion and it won't heal you fully, so they are riskier, but now you can move and run with them, so there really is no risk. The Potion Flex was an insta-heal, but it took a long time to use. It was incredibly risky, but it was worth getting it off safely. Now, like, look at this. This is this is this is just silly. Like, there's no there's no stress here. The reason the potion flex was so good was that it forced you. It forced you, whether you wanted to learn or not. It forced you to learn the attack patterns of the monsters. I know the attack patterns of most creatures in Freedom Unite because if I didn't, I never got a chance to heal. Now in Rise and in World, you just walk away and heal. You can fucking heal while being attacked, and that's not a thing in Freedom. Can't do that at all. Now I agree. I love not needing more than one bug net for bugs. And I, I will say I am glad that whetstones and pickaxes don't break and aren't limited anymore. But if there's anything I can possibly say, anything positive I can possibly bring up about Monster Hunter Rise, this combat is phenomenal. I love the switch skills, the damage, the satisfaction of pulling off an interesting attack, and I keep coming back over and over and over again just to make sure I'm still good at fighting these things. I love it all. So even though Rise sacrificed the thing I didn't even know I loved about Freedom Unite, it 100% added enough stuff for me to enjoy it for a long, long time. Hey, uh, if you're wondering why the Rise part was shorter than the Freedom Unite part, that's the point. I purposely made the Rise portion of this video shorter than the Freedom Unite portion for one specific reason. There is less things in Rise despite showing off more. It may seem more detailed and more intricate, but it lacks the depth of all previous entries. I'm not saying one is better. I'm not saying one is worse. Classic Monster Hunter and Modern Monster Hunter appeal to two separate types of fans. What I'm saying is, was it worth losing the charm of the classic games? There were some things that were charming about the previous games that weren't annoying, like a farm. You know, the Argosy and the farm are two completely separate things, and one is clearly superior than the other. Was it really worth losing that kind of charm in order to focus on one thing. I like Monster Hunter Rise. I like Monster Hunter World. And I like Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. All of these games apply to me as a Monster Hunter fan. It's very clear 
that the step in direction from the classics to the modern, it didn't account for everything that made the classic great. There's things in the old games that are annoying, sure, but they were there for a very valuable reason. There were just things you had to learn how to use. And the new games kind of just did away with all of that. I like Monster Hunter. Period. I'm going to play every new installment that ever comes out. I think Capcom has struck gold with this series. I just think, you know, Monster Hunter, you should be hunting the monsters. This video is long. It's really long. And I worked really hard on it. I'm happy that it's over. It's been like two and a half weeks since I started working on this thing. So I, I honestly, I lost count of how long ago I started this. I really, really hope you enjoyed it. Even if you don't really agree with everything I said, maybe give Monster Hunter a try. Maybe try Freedom Unite. You can get it on the PPSSPP emulator. And there's also a thing that I used in this video called Hunsterverse. Uh, you didn't mishear me say that, I said Hunsterverse. Hunsterverse is, um, don't worry, I'm not being sponsored by them. Don't freak out by that. I wanted to play online Freedom Unite with my buddy Swanee. Thanks to this Discord group, I was able to do it. With a couple of mods and a couple of little finagling with a little bit of things, this dude, his name's Zach, he was able to find a way to make online servers for Freedom Unite, a exclusive LAN co-op only game. Honestly, the dude's a friggin' genius. Is free, didn't cost me anything, and I, just, I got to play a really, really good game with my friend online with zero issues. So that's the end of this video. I hope you really enjoyed it. I'd like to thank my patrons for everything. I'd like to thank the GamerSups people for sponsoring me. Don't worry, they didn't sponsor this video, they just sponsored me. From the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you watching this video. I, I really hope I did a good job entertaining you, and you know, I really hope you learned something along the way. If even one more person tries Monster Hunter because of the way this video went down, I think I did a pretty good job. I, I don't really have anything else to say. I hope you had fun. I hope you liked it. I hope my time wasn't wasted. You know, I hope the algorithm doesn't bury this underneath a bunch of TikTok videos. But if you liked what I did, and you know, you thought I did a pretty good job, I'd love to do more of these in the future for more games that you and I both like. I hate to ask, but if you want to support me, I'd love it if you joined my Patreon. It's completely optional, you don't have to do it, but you'd be helping me out immensely. I appreciate your generosity, and I hope you really enjoyed the video.